Hi, and welcome to this episode of the 360 podcast, an all-round look at student-centered education. I'm Adrian Pumphrey, and in this special episode, we chat with educators from across Park Tudor's campus, and we discuss what life has been like teaching and learning during a pandemic. We are joined by Christian Jacobs, who is uh, head of the World Languages Department. We chat with Brandy Williams, who is a fifth grade teacher in the lower school, and with Heather Carmody, who is a math teacher uh, in the middle school. We chat about challenges they've faced, as well as unexpected opportunities that have presented themselves during this challenging time. Enjoy the episode. Well, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. It's really good to see you. And um, uh, I'm sorry that we can't do this interview in person. Uh, but by this point, I think we're all kind of used to seeing people on computer screens. Um, but I wanted to start by um, going around and just asking you uh, what it's been like for you in the past few months with um, teaching and learning during COVID. And, um, what your experience has been and um, maybe just sharing uh, a little bit about um, what you've what, what you found it to be to be like during this time so let's start I'm going to go in the order of my computer screen uh, which starts with Christian so uh, yeah what what has it been like for you um, I, I would say overall it's been a, a pretty good year um, I, I started the year kind of thinking that there were going to be more challenges than I really ended up facing. So I felt um, coming into the year uh, a little emotion, like emotionally, like very, very like on the edge and, and not really sure about what was going to go on and, and, and not really sure about how the pandemic was going to, you know, come in or, or not come into the school. Um, and so, you know, we were given the task to, you know, simultaneously have students online joining us in class and, um, and be, you know, physically present as well. And I remember just thinking, like, just almost just panicking, like emotionally, just kind of wondering, like, how am, how am I going to pull this off? And, you know, little by little, I'd say over the first couple of weeks, I, I was kind of pleasantly surprised. Um, I was able to find ways to get the, the students coming in from Zoom to, you know, participate in discussions. Um, I felt like I was able to continue to do most of the things that I had been doing in my classes before. Um, and I, I had the benefit of, of, of repeating the same courses that I was teaching. So I felt like I had a solid ground on what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then really it's, it's been like little more small kind of adjustments. And um, I would say the biggest one that I'm, I'm still working on is trying to figure out how to deal with space. Um, you know, I'm so used to moving around, so used to having the kids move around and just, just trying to find different ideas and different things in terms of space, which I'm sure we'll talk about in more detail. Yeah, I mean, that's a big one for world languages, right? Because you guys have embraced a comprehensible input and uh, that's a lot of movement, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, moving around. And uh, how have you been able to handle that during this time? Yeah, so we've had to get a little more creative on brain breaks. I mean, how, how to get people out of their seats and kind of get that primacy recency going, um, even though, you know, we have some people at home and we have some people right in front of us. And so um, a lot of things that, that really have involved more physical movement um, have been more vertical. <laughs> so kids sitting and standing, kids doing things kind of in their own space rather than kind of interacting and sharing space. And surprisingly, a lot of the activities that we do um, still kind of work in that format. And I think we've been pleasantly surprised to see even the kids at home, like standing up and participating and doing these activities. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I guess my biggest message that I want to communicate on this is like, we can't, we can't throw away kind of best practices right now. Like we, we just need to find ways to, to tweak them. Um, and so I think, I think my department's been, been pretty good about sharing these kinds of ideas. I mean, I'll just give one. We used to, a lot of us would do what we call the marker game. So real quick kind of reviews, you put a marker between two students and you, um, you know, you ask a question and the first, you know, if, it, if they think that it's true, they, they try to grab the marker. Um, so obviously you can't do this um, <laughs> during a, a COVID pandemic. Uh, so we've, we've found ways um, either through like clickers, signals, mm -hmm. lights, standing up, um, different kind of manipulatives um, that replace and kind of keep the same idea. And I'd say the last one, um, I love this game called Grudge Ball. Um, so you, you have a series of questions and the students, um, they put X's on the board and then they kind of try to decide um, which team they'll attack if they get the answer right. So they get the answer right, they can erase an X and then they get a chance to shoot. 
uh -huh. right? So uh -huh. there's the problem, right? Like we can't hand a ball and have everybody shoot. Well, I mean, I happen to, you know, have my homeroom in a science room and I just in passing a hey, what, how can I do this? Well, we have gloves <laughs> in every single classroom. So you, you, can, you can walk through a world language uh, hall probably about any, uh, during any given week and you're gonna see some in lab equipment <laughs> like, like shooting a ball. Um, so we just, we just had to be more creative and, and kind of trying to find solutions to do some of the same activities that we've had in the past. Absolutely, that's encouraging to hear about. Um, Brandy, I'm gonna come to you next. Uh, I know you've been, um, uh, teaching hard in fifth grade and you guys had a little experience at home as well, right? So you've seen things from both sides. Yeah. Um, how has that been for you? So what we did in fifth grade was um, Like right before school started a lot of people We thought we oh we have a couple in each classroom that would want us that were gonna stay home uh -huh. And then as we have those kind of like mini conferences and you get to know more people are saying so we have decided um not to return and we were like uh as in tomorrow like you won't be here and we've been planning for you so we quickly realized that we had enough that would form its own kind of like homeroom right uh -huh. Uh -huh. so um we had 11 students in the to in all of fifth grade so we got creative the day before school started and started thinking about okay now what if, what would that look like if we have one complete virtual homeroom and while we are departmentalized in fifth grade, so we each teach our own kind of content, we were thinking, wouldn't that be better than just kind of trying to put your computer in a spot and then having a couple here, a couple here, and there. And overwhelmingly, I think that it has made the students happy because they were not um, different. They were all at home. They're all in a box on a screen. They're all like doing a Brady Bunch thing. And you could commit your time just to them on the screen and you didn't feel like you were splitting. And I don't really, like I think the hybrid model can work because now um, there are people that have decided to return. So that's what I'm experiencing now. But getting their feet kind of wet with the big, you know, beginning of fifth grade and they were all together and it looked the same, I think has been um, just like a great experience for them. And they, it was very important once the people returned, we said, well, they're already a homeroom, so they must stay together. So then I was like, well, um, let me try this hybrid model because the thought was also too, well, will you just be the virtual homeroom teacher? Um, so right now I have three students that have returned and um, so now it's still not balanced, but that's their homeroom. Those are the people they're used to seeing. We start the day always together. And um, I asked, I, I said the three that were here, I said, are you, how do you guys feel? And they were like, oh, I'm so happy to be back. I said, so you don't feel lonely? And they're like, no, I mean, we're together. We've been together. So that's been really um, encouraging. And yeah, we like it. And then there was a, an incident where my daughter had gotten sick. And I mean, I've already been virtually teaching from home. so. I just did it. It was like nothing really happened as long as there was someone here to, because um, the students had returned, to just kind of watch those students that were here. I, I don't want to seem like it was babysitting because it wasn't, but just to physically, I mean, they're used to seeing me in a box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just continued um, on and um, yeah. And my daughter being sick, it was not um, COVID related. It was just four year old related. So. Sure which we have to remember kids did get sick um, before the pandemic. I had to remind myself that too. Right. <laughs> that does happen. <laughs> did, you, um, did you have a switch in like the design of your lessons when everyone was virtual versus when it was hybrid? Um, I really tried to keep it a lot the same um, and that they were getting the same, um, same instruction and basically the same assignment. Um, but I, it really makes you look at, okay, what is absolutely essential? Okay, we were already like using Canvas and you must put your objective on there. So you really are looking at like, okay, what is absolutely that you want them to do? Because it becomes, it's not about something that you've already done and you already have, have made this up and it has these, it's like, 
hmm, what questions do I absolutely need them to answer and to understand? So it really started making me look at what I want everyone to know. What is the purpose of this lesson and what is like the actual outcome? Um, because I'm having to recreate it all for in a, in a digital setting. So it needs to be concise and, you know, to the point. So. Absolutely. Thanks, Brandy. And then, uh, Heather, uh, you've possibly had the, the experience of the most days teaching uh, virtually, uh, <laughs> but kind of a unique situation going on there. Um, how has it been uh, for you over the past few weeks? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't think I was uh, looking for that award, but Soko. <laughs> um, Who got so it, girl? Got it. All I had um, the <laughs> The details don't matter, but for medical reasons, I taught from home for almost a month. Um, it was not COVID related. And I was thinking to your starting question, Adrian, of like just reflecting back, what do we think about in this first quarter? And the first two things that come to mind for me are gratitude and accessibility. Um, so with gratitude, like it's so silly, but just hearing teenage voices, <laughs> I miss that. So in August, I was like, oh, there are 13 year olds that I get to hang out with and do math. And I realized that's like the dorkiest middle school teacher thing to say. But since this pandemic has started, I'm more okay being like out loud about my inner dork who has always been there. But I think it's okay um, to connect back to what you were saying, Christian, about like sort of acknowledging the emotions that went into this. I'm much more comfortable now with my students saying, I missed you guys. Um, so with me being off campus, like there wasn't a day that didn't go by that I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, I wish I could be there. Um, and the other piece of gratitude is unique to my situation, but I think it's um, transferable too. I'm so grateful for our colleagues. So I had a co-teacher that was doing all the parts of our job that are not math. Um, and wow, there's a lot of our job that's not math. So he was here doing that, but his you know professionalism and then colleagues covering classes sharing lessons like that i'm so grateful um, for those things and i did not expect teaching in a pandemic to make me more aware of gratitude that's kind of a weird thing <laughs> um and then the other thing that really came to mind is accessibility and i certainly thought about that before like like you were saying, Brandy, how can I make the lesson as much the same for my in-person students as my at-home ones? So little things like what microphone do I need to use? Which way should my screen be pointing? Um, things like that. But then at home, when I was teaching from there, the accessibility takes on a whole different thing. How do I do classroom participation when I'm not in the same geographic location? Um, how do I give quick meaningful feedback when I can't just sort of float over six feet away and say, that's really cool what you're doing. Um, so those were some of the pieces I thought about. I've also thought about accessibility in terms of our students sort of communication styles. Mm -hmm. um, so for my extroverted life out loud middle schoolers, they've made the transition to speaking with masks and having to like shout their question from the back of the library because I teach three out of my five classes in the library now so that we're socially distanced. Some of our students are fine. Like they're willing to stand up and bellow from the back. But then we've got those other kids that are just as thoughtful and want to participate. So it's been really interesting to figure out how do I give them spaces and modes to share their ideas where my usual tricks don't work <laughs> right now. Um, so I think those, the gratitude and the accessibility, that's really been kind of my fall. Yeah. I'm just, I'm hearing lots of things about um, things that have, uh, unexpected things that have come out of this, uh, this time of this pandemic. And um, Christian, you talked about having to be more creative. Uh, Brandy, you were talking about having to think about uh, what is essential uh, during this time. And, you know, Heather, you were, you were just talking about um, uh, having to uh, come up with new ways of communicating. Um, I'm thinking, what else, what else do you think you've learned during this time about teaching and learning? Or how, how do you think you've improved in teaching and learning where you may not have if it wasn't for this pandemic? Um, I think that I could 
echo what Heather was saying is you don't realize how much you like miss your students like voices. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I mean, that that was unexpected and how just like there's a lot of heavy things that are going on and um, you are consuming all of this and then just them starting the day with them is so refreshing and just hearing their um, 10 almost 11 year old voices and them laughing and then the willingness to do things that are kind of silly like I mean I took something from a preschool page and was doing um, scavenger hunts in their house just so we could run around our house Someone then thought I said run outside and I couldn't understand why he wasn't returning so quickly. I'm like, what is taking him so long? He was leaving. He was going outside then coming back. But that was fun that we could spend um, the morning doing that and kind of starting our day. So, and the other thing is that was unexpected for me is like, this has been a challenge, but that it's not, I didn't expect that I wouldn't rise to the challenge, but that I would really like it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is kind of fun. Um, now, I don't know if I speak for everyone, but I really started to think like, yeah, this whole um, virtual teaching, this is kind of fun and seeing the resource. And then I really leaned into resources with, there's so many teachers out here that are doing this and seeing what they were doing and how they were making it work. And I, it just, that part was fun to see, oh, okay, we can, we can do this, um, so. Excellent. I would jump in with that, Brandy, on the resources that are available just sort of at large, but also, you know, our department has always shared things and, hey, I found this neat thing, but we've gotten, at least I've found even better with, here's a really cool activity. I created it in Canvas and they can share it digitally. Or, you know, I'm working on this topic, a colleague ends up creating something in Desmos, which is a math based um, internet sort of um, portal. I'm not describing it terribly well. I think one of the things that I've, I don't know that I would say I'm great at yet, but I've had a lot more practice with is just um, managing all the technology. So yes, we all had the chance to work some with Zoom, but how do I get more effective with that? Um, I really, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I love the chat feature um, because students can ask that quick question without having to have their like big booming voice, you know, in a way that their classmates can hear it. I've also really uh, sort of tried to embrace the um, uncertainty of le learning new technologies like Nearpod um, and Pear Deck and some other things. And I'm not good at it, but it's really cool to start thinking about how can I take the things that I've gotten comfortable with in teaching mm -hmm. and improve them and get back to that refining that you were talking about too, Brandy. Like what, what can I do in this new sort of technological space that makes what I was doing even better? Yeah, I, I would add to that. Like, I think it's it's really about digital digital literacy and like being being pushed and challenged in that way, and then forcing yourself to 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 finally do it. Um, and I think Nearpod is a great example of that for a lot of world language teachers. So, a lot of us have built you know PowerPoints, and we've had everything kind of structured that way. Well, Nearpod allows you to really build engagement, like student feedback, immediately into the tool. Um, and it works across, you know, in person and online platforms. And so we've been pleasantly surprised with some of those discoveries. And I'm slowly going to kind of transition my old kind of PowerPoint slide technique to kind of feed them into Nearpod and give students um, a little more engagement and a little more challenge kind of during the um, the quote unquote lectures. And I, I think like that that's actually been as a language teacher, that's been probably the, the, the weirdest discovery for me. Like we've had to kind of go back to being more lecture style teachers. Um, and I, to kind of piggyback on what Brandy was saying, I think, I think it's, it's really forced us to be like more organized and more kind of streamlined in what we want to actually talk about. So yeah, we might've sacrificed a little bit of improvised speaking, um, at the beginning of our, you know, the first five minutes of our classes, but in some ways we've also kind of countered that with having, um, really, really concise, like lessons that are easy to follow in multiple formats. And then also have kind of the added benefit of, of leaving a really nice kind of record and things that kids then can access later and can review. So 
um, there's, yeah, there, I would definitely say there's been some pleasant surprises on the technology side. So with, with the technology that you are kind of implementing into your classrooms now that maybe you didn't last year, are you at the point, I know I am as a teacher, I'm wondering if you guys are at the same point where you're also thinking about, but how do we get some of those older ways of doing things because we are in person, right? So we, we do want to, you know, leverage technology, um, especially if we have some virtual learners in the same class as um, in-person people. But I'm, I'm personally finding moments where I'm like, how, you know, you can't move the desks and you can't cluster up into small groups, but when can we do some small group work so they do still have that time without the screen? Or if we have, you know, I'm, I, I think in my class, I at the most one virtual learner in every section I teach. So I just plop my computer onto another kid's desk and I'm like, all right, there's another friend, like meet, some, meet someone new. Um, are you guys finding that too? Or are you really just sort of pushing forward um, with technology? Yeah, the this, this small group thing is huge in world language. Um, and so we've, we've really had to brainstorm on this one. Some of the teachers have, have purchased these portable tripods and they'll, they'll zoom in on their phone and uh, I've experimented with this two times. I mean, they'll, you literally can take it and plop it wherever you want so that that student then can immediately partner with whomever you want them to, to, to partner with. Um, I think the, the other thing that I've used in it, it's um, in so many ways, I think as language teachers, even in the high school, like we, we steal strategies from elementary. <laughs> so I've, I've never used like random name callers in the way that I have now like flippity or the, these just you know partnership pro like you click it and it immediately calls someone's name because I don't know about you all but I think the this if I've had a struggle with kind of the small group or like overall big group discussion it's that you tend to have one or two students that that as Heather was saying feel more comfortable and are more boisterous and so particularly in this challenging like format, you have to, you have to really kind of push the envelope to get everybody engaged and, and participating. And so I've been using more of those like online um, name calling, you know, tools and it, it's, you know, it's not always, it's not always a success, but overall, I mean, it, it also makes sure that I'm, um, while I'm trying to juggle, you know, the computer and the presentation and the students in front of me and the students at home, it also kind of like evens the playing field and make sure that I'm like being attentive to everybody in the class. Yeah, I, 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 as per usual, lower school is leading the way with initiatives and how to connect with students. Um, but um, I'm wondering, I think it's, it would be good for us to acknowledge the challenge of this time and just, you know, just put out there that this is a really difficult time um, for everyone uh, in many ways. I, uh, I would love to know what have been your biggest uh, challenges during this time? What, what, has, what has been hard for you um, over the past few months um, that you've had to overcome in some way? Um, I would say the challenge that I have is um, the feedback that I want to give the students um, immediately. Um, you would think it would be easier um, digitally, but it's funny how it can kind of sit there in Canvas a little longer than it would if it were a paper on my desk. And maybe that's just a personality thing, but with a paper thing, it, it's like it's haunting me and it's looking at me and I need to get it back. But if it's an assignment in Canvas, it's it's still haunting me ter technically because it's on the side, but I can ignore it. And so um, I realized that, okay, you really need to um, you know, give this <clears throat> feedback and I, I had did put some pressure on myself. It's like 24 hours. Um, I think I needed to relax a little bit on that. And the, the real challenge is, um, just like I've been telling the students, you need to be patient with yourself. You need to be patient with technology, just like the being patient with everyone yourself, them, technology, because it is, there's a lot going on. And um, even though they seem happy, there's still some things and there's, there's different reasons why people are at home. That was my other thing too. So I need to be just patient with everyone's situation because attendance sometimes is not always perfect um, via Zoom for 
a variety of reasons. And that was getting me a little bit down like, okay, now we've set this up. Now you've got to come. Everybody's got to come every day. And it's like, okay, there are reasons. So just being kind of um, patient. I don't know if I really answered that question, but that was something. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I feel like this is the year um, for me in particular of pure exhaustion, if I'm answering your question, like honestly. Um, so it, I've, I've had to step aside at night from from teaching and um i think this is something that's pretty common among the faculty and so for you know for parents or students or anybody kind of outside of list, who's listening to this i i think that same grace that um that you're talking about brandy like if we can kind of receive that on our end i it i don't know exactly what it is i can't quite pin it down I and mean, i i think it's the the combination of wearing the mask of moving to different spaces to teach um, of, of kind of the stress, just the overall, just kind of stress of like having to manage zoom and the pe like, there's just a, um, a level of exhaustion when I'm at home and I've just not quite experienced. And a lot of us have little kids as well. And so we're trying to bring energy at home. Um, so I, I've really just tried to step away at night and, and, um, and I, I know that I know that it'll be okay. And I, I, I just have to kind of accept that. For me, one of the big challenges has been managing my own expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I want to do the best I can for the students and I have ideas in my head of how things have worked in the past. And sometimes that translates really easily, but sometimes what we need to do to keep them safe means I can't do things the way that either is the best or at least are what I think um, are the best approaches. So that grace and kind of giving myself a little bit of slack. I've had, you know, a couple lessons that went way better than I thought. And that was super exciting. And then I had a few that I was like, wow, that one was a dud. And, you know, just reminding myself that it was 40 minutes, that nobody's mathematical career is made or, braid, made or broken with, you know, one lesson. But those expectations for myself are tricky, you know, kind of that voice in the back of my head of, but I should be doing this or, you know, I could be. So figuring out where that balance is of what's realistic and manageable and safe above all. Um, that's, I think that's probably what sort of spins in my head the most in the evenings when I'm trying to take a break. Heather, I was going to say, there's nothing worse than a dud Zoom lesson. Oh, we have them yeah. all together and it really does it. I mean, you want to talk about thinking about your teaching. You're like, oh my goodness. And you're watching it play out in a way that we don't in our classrooms when they're oh. person. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, and for me, so your Zoom experience is a little different from mine, but for mine, like I could see my in-person students all like squished in this little box with a camera in my classroom. And so I'd say, okay, who's got an idea? And like, I, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I thought, whoa, okay, how can I improve this? I could, I could yeah, there was a couple of lessons, Heather, where I sat in while you were teaching and, um, yeah, the students did a great job, but it's, it's so challenging across the screen. It really is difficult, um, yeah. uh, but it was, it was great at the same time. Um, I, I think we have about time for one more question. I really wanted to um, uh, end with just uh, a little bit personally in thinking about during this challenging time, um, how are you looking after yourself? Like, so how are you... Um, how are you doing self-care right now? Because I think we all need some of that um, during this time. And uh, yeah, how's that going? I think the silence there. <laughs> it's, not, it's not going, is it? It's, it's not the greatest year for self-care for me, I won't lie. I mean, um, I, I'm a runner. I, I still try to go out and go running. Um, I try to find moments of, um, Kind of as i mentioned before like really unhooking and trying to just be present um in my family life um i, th I think i think it's challenging for some of us that have parents that are maybe in the high risk area so i haven't i haven't seen my father since this all started um my mother lives locally but you know we we only see each other outside um so i think the i think 
those are those kind of like just interpersonal relationships that we depend on so much um, until we can kind of get back to some sort of a norm. I think we're always going to be challenged in, in terms of self care. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's really important that, you know, we just acknowledge this, that, you know, we, we might not have perfect answers to that question or, or <laughs> solutions. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, we, obviously if this thing goes on for two to three years or, or more, like we, we, uh, we need to continue to ask ourselves this question, but I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you all have some great solutions for me that I can, <laughs> that I can piggyback on. Um, I have some TV shows that are my guilty yes. pleasure, and I just um, will watch them, and, like, I just kind of make time for that and make time to watch them with my husband, and I also um, really just, Christian, like you, just make time to unplug because I have little um, kids and they need me and I was finding at the beginning that I was like no mommy has to do this mommy has to do that and it's like I can't ever get that time back with them and um, I need to be able to give them the attention um, I think my answer for this is a bit ironic given my health situation but I'm gonna stick with it um, part of the ways for self-care for me are being outside um, and moving. Now, I'm not a runner. Um, my family does a lot of hikes and things like that. So it's a little tricky that like my own health things mean that that's been scaled back quite a bit. But it, trying to just as much as I can be outside, even if that's on my screened in porch, um, just to give myself a different view than, you know, the computer screen, which is so powerful and useful, but that outside time um, I think provides a lot of balance when I can remember to do that and the physical movement whatever you know I can get it because I think a lot of us we sort of get tense and I'm not even aware of it so even if I can you know stretch a little bit or walk a little bit down you know the trail by my house those are the things I'm trying to do, but I'm by no means great at it. Um, I like your idea, Brandy, too. We have a couple shows that my husband and I watch and they're not like super powerful or gonna <laughs> change the world, but it's nice to just like take a break for a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I just think anything we can do right now to look after ourselves, right, I think is, is hugely important. And um, yeah, I appreciate your insights into that um unfortunately we've come to the end of our time together but i, I, I could talk for hours more with you guys i've, I've really appreciated seeing you uh, i've hardly seen some of you on campus so this is just great and as an extrovert this is like food to my soul so um it's very good to see you guys and um thank you for your um your work every day i know the kids appreciate it i know the parents and your colleagues appreciate it so um keep going and uh, thank you for hanging out with us this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you.